Um, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Debharati Chatterjee, uh, popularly called Debbie. I am a professor and faculty at uh, Ayuka in Pune in India. Um, thank you to uh, the LIGO India team for inviting me to give uh, a talk uh, on the occasion of um, this lecture series called Gravitational Wave at Home. Um, and this is really a fantastic uh, opportunity to, to um, follow the series of lectures during lockdown uh, from the comfort of your home. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, how we can probe neutron stars with gravitational waves. And this is something um, I work on personally. And um, I know a lot of my friends are joining me from different parts of the world. So let me welcome you all by saying hi. And um, at the end of my talk, I'm going to share my um, social media contacts, my email, my uh, web page, where um, I'm going to post uh, lectures eventually. So if you have any technical questions or expert questions, don't hesitate to get back to me. Um, because a lot of my friends are not from the physics background, I'm going to keep this talk very general. So let's get started. Um, so the story of neutron stars begins with this young girl called Jocelyn Bell, who was a PhD student at the University of Cambridge. Um, and back in 1967, she was working with her supervisor, Anthony Hewish, um, where she was even uh, expected to construct radio telescopes and uh, work on quasars. And um, what happened was uh, she noted some scribbles that you can see on the left hand side of the page. And uh, these she marked with a question mark and moved on. But uh, she was eventually convinced that these are not uh, man made sources. So um, she's credited with the discovery of what we now called pulsars. Uh, so basically like a rotating, um, pulsating, rotating uh, radio sources. And uh, it was um, understood later that these are actually neutron stars, which basically give off um, electromagnetic radiation from its poles and uh, which sweeps the earth like a lighthouse. Um, so we observe these periodic, very periodic pulses. Um, that she noted. Unfortunately, the credits to this discovery of pulsars went to um, Anthony Hewish and uh, Martin Ryle, who were awarded uh, the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1993. But um, of course, um, now that we know about uh, Jocelyn Bell, she was uh, in 2018 awarded the Breakthrough Prize. And um, the great woman that she is, she actually donated uh, this money to the cause of um, women in physics who are from underrepresented groups. So um, Jocelyn Bell um, monitored neutron stars with her radio telescope. But now, like since 1967, we have advanced in technology and we have at our disposal a large number of ground-based and space-based telescopes which scan the, the sky throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. So you can see that visible light is actually a very small portion of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And, uh, we, and we are lucky actually that neutron stars are observable throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. So um, let's look at this, these fantastic images from the Crab Pulsar. Um, so the, the Crab Nebula, um, as you can see in the pictures, in, at different frequencies like radio, visible, uh, infrared, and so on, they show the interstellar gas, whereas um, on the left, this X-ray image actually shows us the, the Crab Pulsar in the center. So, um, this is actually um, called multi-wavelength astronomy because we are uh, observing the sky at multiple frequencies. And these kind of uh, telescopes actually reveal a wealth of information about these objects. Um, for example, here on the left, you see binary neutron stars. And these, uh, particularly in binary neutron stars, um, uh, we can detect uh, relativistic effects. So not only Newtonian, but uh, general relativistic effects, which help us to determine the masses of these objects very accurately. Um, also, we can determine the radius from thermal and 
history studies, but these have large uncertainties. What is promising is that in the near future, uh, we will get very accurate data from the recently launched uh, NICER mission, which is the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. And um, on the figure on the, at the bottom right, you can see that recently it has also started giving us uh, constraints um, on the radius of neutron stars. Um, other than this, we can observe um, precision in neutron stars. From precision, we can measure its moment of inertia, which also gives us um, the product of its mass and radius squared. Um, we can also get uh, the compactness of neutron star, which is basically the ratio of mass and radius. And this we can also determine from X-ray spectra from the redshift. At the bottom, you can see that uh, neutron stars also show features like uh, flares and outbursts. And uh, these also give us indications of how strong the magnetic field in neutron stars are. So um, finally, after all these uh, observations, we have accumulated a lot of facts about neutron stars. So what are these? These are actually compact objects which are formed at the end point of evolution of um, uh, massive stars which end in supernova explosion. And um, we know a great deal about neutron stars. Um, they have huge masses. The mass could be about um, up to two solar masses, two times that of the sun. Um, but within a radius, a tiny radius of only 10 kilometers. So you can imagine if you crush uh, the sun into a radius of only 10 kilometers, how dense will the matter be? So neutron stars are actually the densest forms of matter in the universe. Not only that, um, we have also uh, cooling studies which show us that uh, the temperature of neutron stars is extremely low compared to the excitation energies of particles, which means that they are ultra cool and we couldn't even have superfluidity in their interior. Magnetic fields, like I said, um, are shown by flares and outbursts um, is that neutron stars have ultra strong magnetic fields. So um, it could be up to 10 uh, followed by 12 zeros for normal pulsars. And there are even a class of neutron stars called magnetars for which they could be thousand times stronger. So um, of course it makes uh, life very difficult for people who are trying to understand how neutron stars work, but it also makes it very exciting. So um, if we try to make a picture of what the neutron star could look like inside, it would be like this. So at the surface, neutron stars would have nuclei, like iron nuclei. And as we go towards the interior, the density increases rapidly up to um, 10 times that of normal nuclei at the center. So we actually go through various different forms of matter and very complicated structures. Um, which we cannot test here on Earth. So you might say, oh, why? We can conduct nuclear experiments. We have particle accelerators. And um, the thing is, I will tell you why it doesn't work. So this is a, um, a figure which shows you how the temperature and density of matter that we know varies. And you can see that we are actually looking at different parts of this diagram. Uh, when we look at different systems. So a uh, large hadron collider, so one of these particle colliders, they are actually probing this part of the temperature density diagram um, because the matter produced in colliders is actually hot and dense. On the other hand, nuclei, these are produced in nuclear experiments, these are cold, but um, these are close to nuclear saturation density. Whereas, uh, uh, neutron stars, you can see they are far from nuclei because at the center we can have up to 10 times uh, nuclear density and they are cold. So actually, even though we can get some clues and hints from uh, the behavior of matter in accelerators and nuclei, uh, we are actually groping in the dark, let's say, and we are trying to put a puzzle together uh, to understand what's going on in the interior of neutron stars. This is a multidisciplinary, uh, very challenging problem. Um, one thing we, um, we know from particle accelerators and nuclear experiments is that 
um, the, the particles, the fundamental particles, which um, make up the neutrons and protons, um, we can actually have a different kind of heavier particles appearing in the core of neutron stars. These particles called like hyperons, kaons or quarks, these are actually seen, uh, so kaons and hyperons are seen momentarily appearing in the center of um, particle accelerators, but for a fraction of a second. Whereas at the large densities that appear in neutron stars, neutron star interiors, we can actually have stable hyperons and kaons forming um, components, stable com components of neutron stars. So um, how can we how can we test this? Because we have no way to look into the interior of neutron stars. So um, these forms of matter, also called exotic forms of matter, can have indirect influences on the observables that we are actually measuring from these different um, with the telescopes and so on. So on the left, I, I'll show you a, a, a figure which is the plot of pressure and density called the equation of state. So equation of state is something that describes the behavior of matter, even like water and ice and so on, so different phases. And um, we know from calculations that uh, the equation of state of neutron stars, uh, when it has only nucleons, is quite stiff, which means it's quite steep. It has a steep profile of the pressure with density. But if these hyperons, kaons, or quarks start appearing in the, in the interior, they take away some of the pressure, uh, they share the pressure from the neutrons, which is why the pressure drops, and uh, it actually is called a soft equation of state. So um, how can we understand um, this from the observables? Um, interestingly, we can um, put this information of the equation of state and uh, produce models of the structure of a neutron star. So if we consider um, equilibrium between gravity and pressure, which keeps the neutron star stable, then um, we can calculate the external structure, so the mass and radius of a neutron star, starting with its equation of state. And then we can compare it with the actual observations of neutron stars. So on the left, you can see uh, this is a very popular picture of a list of the, the different numbers, the neutron stars which have been measured. Um, particularly um, uh, well constrained are the double neutron star binaries. But you can see that there are large uncertainties and most of these are clustered around 1.5 uh, neutron star masses. Um, Recently, so 2010 was a spectacular uh, year when we had a discovery of two extremely massive neutron stars. And the reason was that both of the neutron stars in one of the system were pulsar, so we can actually observe both of them. And the other was a neutron star wide dwarf system, both showing um, extremely strong relativistic effects. And with the help of these, we could actually very accurately measure the masses. And these put very tight constraints in our understanding of the interior composition. So here on the right, um, I put a cartoon to just show you um, if we have exotic matter and nucleonic matter and a neutron star measurement of about, say, 1.4 times that of the sun, all the models, so with or without exotic matter, both can explain this observation. Whereas if you have a two solar mass, you have only nucleons, which um, can satisfy this constraint and not the exotic matter. So um, there was a huge commotion in the community and people said, great, so hyperons are ruled out. But um, people like me, so we had to go back to the drawing board and actually check the calculation to see, to check whether we understand the hyperon interactions very well or whether there are some uncertainties um, that could um, influence our conclusion about um, hyperons in, in massive neutron stars. And the fact is that actually we, we found that hyperons, um, hyperon interactions are not very well understood and we need a very strong repulsion to be able to uh, explain uh, hyperon presence in neutron stars with such large masses. 
But then again, this opens new questions. So in order to have a neutron star, which has exotic matter, as well as has a large mass, um, it, there were calculations which showed that uh, the radii should correspondingly be larger. Um, well, these things are actually very model dependent because there are a lot of people working on many different uh, types of uh, approaches in equations of state, and they do not agree a lot. A lot of times they do, but they do not also agree on a lot of conclusions, which makes the problem very complicated. The other way we could um, observe or detect the presence of, of hyperons or um, exotic matter is by uh, monitoring the cooling of neutron stars. So basically it's temperature versus time. And um, if there were only nucleons, we would have a, um, a standard cooling and an enhanced cooling if uh, we have um, these different kind of exotic forms of matter. But the question is, um, these are indirect forms of um, conclusions of finding signatures of exotic matter. Can we actually probe inside directly um, to see the composition of neutron stars? So one opportunity was given to us by Einstein, who proposed the general theory of relativity in 1915, which said that uh, gravity is not just the force, but it is a curvature of space-time due to the presence of mass. And one of the very uh, interesting uh, predictions of this theory is that if there are any perturbations in the fabric of space-time, um, this could be due to some oscillations in, in the object or by mergers of this object. Um, so this would generate gravitational waves. So um, it could be either uh, objects in uh, like isolated systems or in binary systems. Um, so let's look at neutron stars. What could generate neutron star uh, gravitational waves from neutron stars? So um, one way would be um, glitches. So these are actually sudden jumps in the rotation frequency of neutron stars. Um, in general, you know that neutron stars rotate very periodically. So Jocelyn Bell had observed these very periodic pulses, but then while slowing down by emitting uh, electromagnetic radiation, sometimes neutron stars have sudden jumps in the, in the frequency. And this is because of some reconfiguration, um, because of superfluidity and so on. And this could generate a, a sudden burst of gravitational waves. Also, um, neutron stars and magnetars, uh, so a particular class of extremely strongly magnetized neutron stars, these could also show flare-like features, which we also have in the sun, for example. So these flares would also generate a burst of, of uh, gravitational waves that we could want to detect. The other way is that there could be some kind of deformation, continuous deformations. When uh, the neutron star is rotating, these deformations would generate some kind of non axisymmetric perturbation. So basically, neutron star, so basically, gravitational wave sources are uh, the ones where matter has some kind of non axisymmetric uh, perturbation. So deformation on neutron star could also be of several sources. If there are mountains, uh, it's actually a funny term because mountains, uh, a mountain on a neutron star would actually be a few centimeters high because like uh, the Everest would be crushed to a few centimeters because of the strong gravity. Um, so a mountain on a neutron star or even um, the elongation of the neutron star due to magnetic field, these could all generate continuous gravitational waves. What is even more interesting is that we already know about fluid oscillations. So we know that um, a fluid, when perturbed, could show radial or non-radial pulsations. So for gravitational waves, we are actually interested in uh, non-radial pulsations. And um, so these, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, single-mode non-radial pulsations and mixed-mode on, on the left. And um, if these kind of oscillation modes are uh, triggered in neutron stars, then uh, these could pro produce a non axisymmetric perturbation and therefore gravitational waves. Um, have we ever seen these kind of oscillation modes in astrophysics? Yes, uh, we have already um, studied solar oscillations. 
and uh, stellar oscillations. So these kind of fluid perturbations show up in, in the sun or in, in stars. Um, and uh, these different oscillation modes are um, actually classified and named according to the different kinds of restoring forces that bring the system back to equilibrium uh, once it is perturbed. So um, we have fundamental F modes, um, there are pressure P modes, uh, gravity G modes, which are actually um, restored by buoyancy, and rotational R modes. So this field of study is also called astro-seismology. So this is in analogy with seismology on Earth, right? So you know about earthquakes. Earthquakes also have oscillation modes. And so these are like uh, quakes on the stars, so star quakes. Um, so neutron stars, which are actually uh, compact stars, should have all these fluid modes. And in addition, gravitational um, so uh, modes due to strong gravity. So this is exactly what we found from calculations. So basically neutron stars have these F, P, G, and R modes in, an in analogy with um, as astro seismology, so like uh, normal stars. And also they have a space-time modes or W modes. Uh, this is actually something which is similar to quasi-normal modes in black holes. So, um, Let's look at R modes. So um, why are these modes, or why are we talking about these modes actually? So the thing is that um, these modes can actually help us to directly probe the interior of neutron stars and the frequency or the time uh, of these mode oscillations once detected in gravitational waves would actually give us information about the composition of neutron star interior. So let's take as an example the rotational R modes. So you can see on the right uh, two images of the rotating uh, neutron star in the co-rotating frame and the inertial frame. So one co-rotating frame is one where uh, the observer, we are sitting on the oscillation mode, so it's rotating with the star, and the other one is inertial, which means the uh, observer is actually far away. And uh, uh, there is a mechanism called uh, Chandrasekhar Friedman Schutz mechanism, so which was first proposed by Chandrasekhar in the 1970s. Um, this um, actually says that uh, these kind of modes would be unstable in all rotating neutron stars. So this is good news for us because we want to detect gravitational waves from neutron stars. So any rapidly rotating neutron star, say uh, it could be a newly born neutron star which is rapidly rotating, or it could be a neutron star which actually sucks up material from a companion and spins up. So uh, these modes would be active. And according to Chandrasekhar, these would emit gravitational waves profusely and spin down. But there is, um, if there are, um, if there are viscous forces inside the star, they would try to balance out this instability and stabilize the star. What is the most in interesting thing is that um, these viscous forces actually depend on the composition of matter. And this is what we are looking for. We are looking for signatures of exotic matter, exotic components in the interior of the star in gravitational waves. So, um, here on the left, I'm showing you a cartoon of the rotation frequency of the star um, with its temperature. So if there were nucleons only, then calculations show that um, this red curve, so the uh, line and the dash curve, this actually uh, marks the boundary of the balance between this gravitational wave instability and the viscous forces. So they balance each other and make the star stable. And on the other hand, if there are exotic forms of matter like these hyperons, kaons, or quarks, okay, let's not talk about quarks, it's more complicated. So hyperons or kaons, for example, then um, it would be bounded on the left by this blue curve, say. So this is a cartoon. I mean, we have actual papers uh, showing calculations and uh, very accurate figures, but these are just um, a cartoon to demonstrate what's going on. So in between this part, it's called an instability window. Why? Because this is the window where gravitational waves are allowed to spin down the star. So let's imagine a newly born neutron star rotating very rapidly. 
So as it cools down, it arrives at this instability window. So now Chandrasekhar said, okay, they will become unstable, start to emit gravitational waves and spin down. So this is what we have. If we have nucleons only, this is uh, what we predict. But if we have exotic matter, then we get another trajectory, right? So um, we can try to differentiate between the two scenarios uh, using two different messengers. So one is, of course, gravitational waves that uh, we detect from um, uh, these um, sources, rotating rapidly rotating neutron stars, which are unstable in our modes. And the other one is, of course, frequency. And this is good news because frequency is one of the most uh, accurately measured um, quantities in neutron stars. So this could explain, so our modes could actually explain uh, why we observe uh, neutron stars rotating at a particular frequency and also tell us about the behavior of matter in the interior. So perfect. The only bad news is that um, neutron stars um, have to be isolated for this. No, actually not. So uh, these oscillation modes that I talked about, these could even be, um, of course, they are very active in isolated neutron stars, but these could also be triggered uh, during the merger of a neutron star. So during the merger, there is an in spiral when the neutron stars go around each other. There is the merger when they fuse. And after that, after the fusion, there is a compact remnant which is produced. And this oscillates in these various modes. And finally, brings down to a stable um, compact object. So, um, our, um, so, of course, if we can detect isolated neutron stars, um, gravitational waves from isolated neutron stars, they would give us a lot of information. But we can also try to extract information from the binaries, neutron star binaries. Um, so, let's look at um, observations, what observations of neutron star binaries tell us. So the first observation of neutron stars in binary actually happened back in 1974 when uh, Joseph Taylor and Russell Hulse indirectly measured the spin down of a neutron star uh, binary. So basically when these neutron stars are going around each other, they are approaching each other, giving off gravitational waves. So they are approaching more and more until they finally merge. And um, they showed, they actually measured how the, they spin down and they measured and um, compared it with general relativistic calculations that you see on the left. And um, this exactly matched uh, the calculations. So this was the first indirect proof of um, observation of gravitational waves from a pair of neutron stars for which um, in 1993 they got, uh, was it 93? Uh, yes, I think so. So they got the first um, uh, Nobel Prize for the detection or indirect detection of gravitational waves. So now that we know that gravitational waves um, can be, uh, are, exist, and uh, so the next um, attempt would be to actually construct gravitational wave detectors and try and directly observe them, right? So, um, how can we try to detect gravitational waves um, from the mass motion? So when we have a non-axisymmetric mass motion, um, there is a, a type of instrument called an interferometer, which can measure the relative displacement between the two arms and uh, therefore uh, can measure the frequency and time scale of the gravitational waves. So, um, Neutron. So gravitational waves in general are extremely weak and the, the perturbations which are generated by these very massive objects, even for binary black holes or binary neutron stars, these are extremely weak. So it's like one part in 10 followed by 22. Um, so difference in length, right? So this is extremely minute. And um, so scientists started to devise um, instruments by which this could be measured. Um, this actually meant that such small amplitudes to be detected were needed arm lengths in the interferometer to be kilometers long. So this is what was constructed 
in uh, the photos that you see above, you see uh, the LIGO um, detector, which is the uh, laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory in the United States um, at two sites, Hanford and Livingston. And the Virgo, um, which is at the border of Italy and France. And these um, actually had um, arms which are kilometers long. But this is not the end. There are a lot of technological uh, challenges, which uh, several of the speakers um, have been um, talking about in these gravitational wave at home lecture series. So if you have been following these lectures, um, I think you know these better than me. So um, let's see. So once these were constructed, um, so many of my colleagues actually who have been working on these collaborations, so once in a while I ask them, so have you detected something? And uh, they, uh, they were very hopeful, but then for years, uh, almost a decade, they didn't observe anything because uh, this was a huge technological challenge. But then uh, with rapid advances in technology, uh, the upgraded advanced LIGO detector was built and as you can see in the figure, the sensitivity was even better than the LIGO instrument. Um, soon after the advanced LIGO started operations, in uh, 2016, 11 February, came the phenomenal announcement um, that gravitational waves have been detected from binary black holes. I'm sure many of you might have seen this in the news. Um, so um, how did they detect it? So um, you can see on the left, so this is the typical chirp signal which is expected when two black holes are actually merging. And on the right, you can see the signal um, observed at LIGO, Hanford and Livingston. And uh, you can see that they had detected this typical chirp signal. Um, you can actually um, yeah, have a look at the LIGO websites and there are lots of interesting talks and videos about this discovery. I will not be able to cover everything in this talk. Um, so following this discovery, the uh, Nobel Prize was awarded to Barry Barish, Raina Weiss and Kip Thorne for the first direct detection of gravitational waves. So advanced LIGO, once uh, we know that it can detect uh, binary compact, gravitational waves from binary compact objects, um, then more and more uh, sources were uh, studied. And as you can see in the picture, there were more and more candidates appearing, more and more discoveries of binary uh, compact objects. Um, and then finally, there came a particular uh, observation where this uh, binary compact object, this compact object binary was, um, uh, had a longer, much longer merger time. So these others were about a second, whereas for this, it was um, about 100 seconds. Uh, so the um, astrophysics community took notice and everybody, so the different telescopes which were uh, operating at that time, everybody tried to detect this source. Um, so a miracle happened. So gravitational wave uh, 170817, this was a jackpot for astrophysicists all over the world and in so many different communities. And the reason was that um, not only were these binary, binary neutron stars seen to merge, but also there were observations of a lot of other messengers. So uh, gamma rays, uh, radio, uh, x-rays, and so on. So I will come to this in a second. So this was really a fantastic discovery because um, this was actually the beginning of what we call the multi-messenger astronomy. Um, the reason is that um, so um, once this object was detected, triggers were, so simultaneously all these telescopes were contacted. And um, for example, here on the left, you can see Fermi and Integral, they confirmed uh, the detection of gamma rays uh, from this source. This confirmed that uh, short gamma ray bursts um, are actually associated with mergers of neutron stars. This is something that has been speculated for many years, so there are a lot of models, 
would su suggest this, but this was the smoking gun uh, event which confirmed this. Um, there were also observations from Chandra about um, uh, from uh, in X-rays. There were uh, VLA observations in radio, and um, also um, X shoot. Astroscopy and Magellan telescopes also observed this object in optical, which means they uh, they, ob they observed this kilonova, which means like a, like a supernova, but it's about um, so it's weaker than a supernova, let's say. And um, so the kilonova and the gamma ray, the, the gamma ray burst association with a merger of neutron stars was made for the first time in this observation. So, so many different models were now confirmed. And uh, what is even more spectacular is there was an observation from X shooter which showed uh, in the spectra, you can see there are a couple of uh, absorption features which correspond exactly to two elements, tellurium and cesium. And uh, what is spectacular is that tellurium and cesium were uh, speculated um, to be formed during merging neutron stars, but this was the first observation which, which confirmed uh, this kind of um, a, a process of formation of elements called R process nucleosynthesis. So you can see marked by orange in this periodic table all the elements which are uh, speculated to be produced in merging neutron stars. And this event of uh, merging neutron stars observed in gravitational waves actually confirmed that this is the site of our process nucleosynthesis, which means that um, even the other elements like gold, silver, platinum, which uh, I don't have to explain to you how precious they are to us, the, these were also produced in some uh, merging neutron star binary. So isn't this really fascinating to, to think about? Um, also, let's look at what this taught us about the behavior of matter in the interior of neutron stars. So this is what um, I've been talking about in this talk. So basically looking for signatures of this exotic matter, right? So um, in a merging neutron star binary, uh, you see in the bottom figure that um, there are, when the neutron stars merge, they actually tidally deform each other. So this is like this earth moon tidal locking. Um, and this tidal deformation actually depends on um, something called uh, tidal deformability, which is in turn dependent on the composition of the neutron star interior. So this is a great way to direct probe again into the interior of neutron stars. So you can see a picture that was produced um, by the LIGO Virgo collaboration um, following this uh, fantastic discovery. And you can see that the different models um, have been uh, differentiated depending on whether they are less compact or more compact. And this compactness again depends on its mass and radius and therefore indirectly on the interior composition of neutron stars. Finally, I want to emphasize also that um, not only data analysis, of course, data analysis provides us with um, a lot of um, clues and hints about uh, the different observables of neutron stars, but another extremely important contribution has been from the community working on numerical relativity. So this is basically making simulations of neutron stars isolated or in mergers. And um, this is extremely complicated. So uh, one has to perform general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic um, simulations. So these are actually as complicated as the name is. You have to incorporate effects of general relativity, magnetic field, and hydrodynamics all in the same framework. And um, thanks to the, the advances in technology as well as computation, uh, these have uh, these studies have actually provided us with a lot of information about how these systems behave. And this has provided us with understanding of. Um, how, uh, first of all, to extract signs from gravitational wave observations. And second of all, this is like a feedback. So also to provide better models so that one can 
extract information from gravitational wave sources and look for triggers in, uh, in the gravitational wave uh, surveys. Um, finally, I want to talk about the second uh, gravitational wave um, observation from binary neutron stars. So this happened in 2019. This is the most recent uh, gravitational wave observation from uh, merging neutron stars. Um, this also came as a big surprise because, uh, well, uh, since the previous one had uh, given us so many clues from multi messenger astronomy, people here were frantically looking for, for, for clues and hints from other electromagnetic sources, from neutrino sources, but actually none were found. But, um, surprise, this also gave us information, um, uh, some new information, and this is the that um, this was actually the heaviest binary neutron star ever observed. And um, I think in the previous talk, it was already mentioned that um, there are different uh, classes of neutron stars and black holes, um, and the masses observed uh, depend more or less by the, the way that they are observed. And it was seen that um, the neutron stars um, were, uh, only up to like two solar masses, whereas a black hole masses from, went from five up to 50. Whereas, um, so now the, the LIGO Virgo neutron stars, which means that the gravitational wave, um, the neutron stars observed in gravitational waves, uh, they produce black holes, which started populating what is called the mass gap between these two classes of objects. So this is something extremely exciting. So the Every time we have an observation of neutron stars in binary, um, in gravitational waves, we are um, getting to know something spectacularly new, and which confirms um, a lot of speculated models. Um, finally, I want to say that um, we are um, we have now a global network of gra gravitational wave detectors. So we have uh, LIGO, Virgo in operation, GEO uh, in Germany, Kagra has started operations in Japan, and we are now also looking forward uh, to LIGO India, uh, which is a, a plan, which is an approved uh, LIGO uh, mission, uh, the mission where one of the LIGO detectors will be upgraded and moved to a site in India. And this will actually uh, drastically increase the sensitivity and the localization of gravitational wave sources. So this is something we are really looking forward to. And you can see that there are more and more sources being observed now, uh, more and more candidates of, um, of compact objects in binary. Uh, in the near future, there will also be a lot of space missions and other missions which are being planned. So the LISA mission, which is not particularly very interesting for neutron stars, but for black holes, but um, also the planned Einstein telescope, uh, cosmic explorer, and so on. So there are uh, there is a lineup of telescopes coming up, and so these will provide us with uh, a lot of information about compact objects, and particularly from neutron stars in binary with other neutron stars or black holes, and even hopefully in the future, if we can detect gravitational waves from these isolated sources, we will be able to say a lot about the equation of state, about the interior composition of neutron stars. Uh, in addition, in um, a lot of particle accelerators like uh, Jefferson Lab, Brookhaven National Lab, also, J Park in Japan, um, KEK in Japan, and so on at CERN, uh, at GSI in Germany. There are a lot of hypernuclear experiments going on. These will also provide us information about interaction among uh, these particles. So, this will also help us to improve our models. Um, so, a lot of work is going on right now. This is an extremely exciting field. And um, also keep an eye open for the opportunities because gravitational wave astronomy has just begun. And uh, we will be looking for, for students, for technical support, and so on, um, to make this a grand success. So um, finally, I leave you with my social media contacts. Um, don't hesitate to contact me on 
on any of the social media platforms. Also keep an eye open on my website. I'll be posting the lectures soon where I will actually be giving you the mathematical derivations and uh, the physics background of the, the exciting physics that I talked about today. Um, okay, so I end my talk by thanking you all for joining me here today. I thank uh, my colleagues at Ayuka and the LIGO India team at Ayuka for giving me this grand opportunity to talk about my favorite field. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, uh, thank you to all my friends and colleagues with whom I've been working on for the past so many years. And uh, wherever you may be, uh, stay safe um, and uh, take care and stay in touch. So. Um, I will go to, I will take some questions now. Okay, so um, so um, so here are some uh, interesting questions from some of the audience here. Um, Ayushi Rajgore asks, why do neutron stars exhibit very high magnetic fields? So of course, this is a very interesting question. Um, so uh, first of all, imagine a normal star. And uh, so neutron stars are actually formed when uh, normal massive, massive stars at the end point of their evolution collapse to, um, I mean, there is a supernova explosion and the core forms a neutron star. So actually, if you imagine the normal neutron star, this has um, a large magnetic field, but there is something called conservation of magnetic flux, which means that the product of the magnetic field and the square of the radius remains constant. So actually, if you crush um, a star to a very small radius, its magnetic field blows up. So this is how we um, think magnetic fields in neutron stars are this high. But then there are even a class of neutron stars stars, uh, not only a class now, there are more and more different classes being observed. So these um, magnetars or high magnetic field pulsars, um, it is still not clear how the magnetic fields could go even thousand times higher. So there are a lot of simulations which are being carried out. Um, people think there could be dynamo effects and so on, but this is an open field. So maybe you will be able to answer this question someday. Um, so uh, Jay Koshik asks, what determines if a high mass star turns into a neutron star or a black hole? So basically it's, um, you know, you can imagine like, like a balloon. So a balloon, how do you think the balloon uh, stays in that shape? Because uh, it's the gas pressure which balances it from collapsing, right? So um, in neutron stars and black holes, so in neutron stars, there is something called a 
degeneracy pressure, which means that the particles inside, they uh, repel each other. And this repulsion generates a kind of uh, pressure which balances the neutron star from collapsing. And um, if um, the, the, it, now it depends on the initial mass of the star, whether its weight its collapsing weight will be now balanced by this kind of repulsion or not. If yes, then it produces a neutron star. If not, if it is too heavy, about say more than eight times that of the sun, then there is nothing that can be stop that can stop it from collapsing to a black hole. And this was actually for the first time um, uh, calculated by Chandrasekhar, for which he um, faced a lot of criticism even So uh, Swarangi Saraf asks, what is the difference between gravitational waves observed from collision of black holes and the collision of neutron stars? So um, gravitational wave from collision of black holes, uh, well, I think I showed you the waveform, right? So there was this chirp kind of signal. So there is this, um, uh, I mean, both of them, they actually go around each other. And then there is this merging, which shows this characteristic chirp signal, which is there in gravitational wave, uh, gravitational wave uh, signals for both black holes and neutron stars. Um, for neutron stars, actually, the thing is that since these are, uh, these consist of matter, there will be, um, a phase when there is this um, the uh, spiral in the in spiral, and then there will be uh, the merger phase when I mean throughout this phase there are tidal deformations, and um, uh, I mean the the signals the signatures of the composition are there uh, encoded in the gravitational wave signal. And this is not present in gravitational wave from black holes, and then finally when uh, the merger happens, it, the, the two neutron stars form a metastable object. Um, it could be a hypermassive neutron star. Uh, there could be a prompt black hole. So it depends on um, a lot of things, including the, the equation of state of neutron stars. This is something we're actually working on right now. And then eventually, maybe this metastable object also collapses into a black hole. So the gravitational wave features so of this pre-merger and post-merger signal from neutron stars will contain all this information about the equation of state that we are looking for, which is not there in the gravitational wave from black holes, right? Um, Harsh Mehta asks, uh, why do we believe there is superfluidity inside neutron stars? So um, neutron stars, um, so like I said, the temperature of neutron stars, this is, um, about one MeV. So MeV is actually like mega electron volt. This is a, a unit of temperature and um, or of energy, let's say. And um, the neutrons are, I mean, the neutron star is composed of electrons, protons, and neutrons primarily. And these have much higher um, energies. And compared to that, uh, neutron stars are extremely cold. So uh, for calculation, practical uh, calculations, we take these as zero temperature. So they are very cold. And um, in uh, terrestrial experiments in condensed matter physics, it has been observed that when you cool any uh, uh, matter to freezing temperatures, to, uh, to very cold temperatures close to absolute zero, what happens is that uh, it, it becomes superfluid, which means it does not show any uh, viscosity. Um, so uh, we believe that this should also be the case in neutron stars. And uh, interestingly, there are also a lot of observations which show these kind of features. Like um, if you actually, uh, in terrestrial experiments, it has been seen that if you put a superfluid uh, in, uh, in rotation, these form uh, like uh, flux tubes if they are charged or they form uh, um, yeah, and so these, um, I mean, what happens is that um, neutron star glitches could actually be produced by uh, superfluidity. I mean, these are complicated to explain uh, as um, uh, just like that. Maybe you can follow some of my lectures, which I will post if 
potentially, but there are uh, like also cooling um, in neutron star cooling observations, which suggest that superfluidity could be present in the interior. So um, this is a fantastic uh, thing to think about, right? Okay, I'm trying to see some more questions. Um, so Tarun Bisht asks, how is it possible that neutron stars have cold equations of state given that they rotate at very high speeds and have high masses? Um, well, cold equation of state, like I said, because uh, the matter in the neutron star is cold and dense. And um, even if they have high speeds and high masses, um, well, the it does not affect the equation of state. Of course, at um, I mean, uh, the let's say the, the models, when we construct them, they have to keep in mind that uh, rotation uh, effects due to rotation and um, should be uh, taken into account and also uh, that they should be able to satisfy the large mass constraints. But um, yeah, so neutron stars, when they are newly born, they are still uh, hot, they contain hot matter, but within a few minutes, they uh, become cold. So we consider cold equations of state. So Yuvraj Murali asks, could you please explain what does it mean when you say neutron star spins down by the emission of gravitational waves? So um, basically, um, emission of gravitational waves means that um, the system loses energy uh, in the form of gravitational waves, right? So for example, um, how can I say this? So um, basically, um, spins down in the sense, I mean, it slows down. So when a neutron star spins, it spins very rapidly. And then once it starts to lose energy in the form of gravitational waves, it has lower and lower energy and therefore it rotates Lower, slower and slower with time. So that's that's what I mean by neutron stars spins down by emission of gravitational waves. Um, how much time do we have? Okay, maybe I'll take a few more questions. Given that post-merger remnant is highly dense and hot medium, uh, does it not probe a different region in QCD phase diagram, which was shown before in your slides from Shitid Agarwal? Um, it's true. It's a very good question. Yeah, of course, um, when we consider, when we model neutron star mergers, uh, merger remnants, we actually have to consider hot and dense matter. And also for newly born neutron stars, which are called proton neutron stars, these are also hot. And when we perform calculations, we have to keep in mind that there are thermal effects involved. Yes. But um, still, it's um, so some of the, the uh, clues about the behavior of um, hot and dense matter are given by um, given by these um, the other like accelerators and so on, but uh, still they are a um, slightly different uh, regime of the, the phase diagram that I showed in my slides. Okay, maybe the last question. Swarangi Saraf, do R waves, P waves, and G waves leave imprints on the gravitational waves emitted from merging neutron stars? Um, yes, so until now we have not um, detected or uh, decoded the post merger gravitational waves from the gravitational wave 170817, but um, these could be active. I mean, uh, the thing is that it involves a lot of modeling and to be able to extract um, how these uh, oscillation modes um, uh, affect the imprints of gravitational wave, this is actually a very tough question to answer. So right now, this is some a very active field. We are uh, working on this. And um, what is, see, what is um, speculated is that not only um, oscillation, like single oscillation mode, but maybe there are coupled oscillation modes. And even like uh, the energies could, could uh, be shared between the modes, which could result in saturation of some of the modes. And this would again affect the whole uh, post-merger uh, emission spectrum. So this is a very 
active field of research and uh, hopefully in future we will be able to answer these kind of questions so um Um, there was a question from Sri Bala. Uh, can you please point out the research opportunities in astro seismology and gravitational wave astronomy? Um, so um, this is a very exciting field. Uh, so um, with uh, the, the recent detection of gravitational waves from compact binaries, particularly uh, compact uh, neutron star mergers, um, a completely different field has opened up, as I already uh, talked about and so there are a lot of research opportunities which are opening up so basically uh, like I said the LIGO India project uh, this is um, coming up soon and we are actually working on um, developing the necessary tools and necessary teams for this uh, we will uh, require students we will require technicians like I said we need a, a very skilled workforce uh, to be able to make the best of it um, we need to develop numerical relativity simulations. We need to understand theory. So astro seismology has several components, right? So there are people who, like me who work on the theoretical modeling. There are numerical relativists. Then there are people who do data analysis. There are people who do observations. And we also have multi messenger astronomy. So uh, in, in collaboration with other uh, branches of astro astronomy, we need to um, uh, build uh, better models. We need to build better algorithms to be able to um, handle the large pool of data which will soon be available. And this is a global network in collaboration with LIGO, uh, with Virgo, with Cabra, and so on. So this is a very exciting field uh, which is why we have started this gravitational wave at home lecture series i hope you learn from it don't hesitate to go back and look at these lectures don't hesitate to contact the speakers um, and uh, prepare yourself if you're interested in this field because uh, indeed there is a lot which is going, going to happen in this field and um, yeah so this is a very exciting times for astro seismology and gravitational wave astronomy so um I think um, I am going to wrap up my talk here. Um, don't forget to tune in on 11, so Monday for the next talk, which will be by KG Arun from the Chennai Mathematical Institute on um, understanding the LIGO black holes. So again at 4 p.m. So do tune in to the next talk and keep following these um, fantastic lecture series from uh, LIGO India. And uh, like, like I said, don't hesitate to contact me or, or to follow my website for um, updates on lectures and other information. So um, thank you very much. Um, I will sign off today. Uh, stay safe. Uh, stay in touch. Thank you very much.